any AFC East uh, projection series, of course, you want to probably start. Conveniently, they're also first alphabetically. But, uh, you know, they, let's admit it. They're the team we want to talk about first. Anyway, that's the Bills. We're going to talk about their 2023 fantasy projections. Uh, just so you guys know, I'm going to put these banners up, and I'm not leaving them. So, right, I'm just going to leave it 10 seconds or so. If you're scrolling through the video, you can see what we're about to do. But we want to. We got some uh, pretty cool uh, numbers on the board behind us. Um, and I don't want to obstruct your view. So I'm taking that down now. Let's talk Buffalo, Wolf. Yeah, let's chat them. And as you'll see when we go through these teams, we love to start with the – it's a great tool, Rotoviz. They have a projection machine. I use it every year. And you start at that market level, the team level. What do you expect in terms of total plays, pass plays versus run plays? And then you kind of distribute the shares from there. So I came up with 641 pass attempts versus 448 rush attempts. That would give them 1089 plays, which would be – just above league average, 41 plays above league average. If you look last year under Ken Dorsey, they go from 680, 631 pass attempts to just 591. Oh man, he took the reins off. Different style of offense after Brian Dayball has left. They were minus 27 plays under the league average. But that I think was a big result of Josh Allen's injury. Remember week eight, We've talked about this on the quarterback rankings, yeah. even on the receiver rankings, looking at digs, and we'll, we'll reiterate a lot of those points here. But they were chucking it at a faster pace more often than ever from weeks one through eight. So I don't think that was a an issue of Ken Dorsey taking the reins. I thought he did a great job. And if you look at weeks one through eight when they were fully healthy, they were pushing it farther down the field and faster pace more than ever. So I think right around that 641 range in terms of pass attempts, a nice big aerial pie with some rushing attempts, a lot of those going to Josh Allen also mixed in there. So that's the overall picture of what I'm seeing for the Bills. Now, how is this all going to shake out in my opinion? So those 628-ish pass attempts, so 640 total, what if somebody has to come in for a play or two? We always just put 2% for the QB2. But ideally, you're getting all those to Josh Allen. And let's talk about how we think that'll shake out. He's different. And we're going to kind of have to go through this one a little bit differently just because Josh Allen is such a different beast. You can't really separate the run and pass games and break them down separately because he's such a big part of both of them. Uh, so you look at him and I think he's going to take in just as he always had, but 25% of the rush is 112. That would be right in line with everything he's ever done. In fact, that would be fewer. He's at 124, 122, 113, and 118 rush attempts these last four years. So this would be the lowest yet. They, they're classic. You know, we want Josh Allen to run less. They're saying that a lot throughout this off season. They signed Damian Harris. So maybe they lessen it a little bit, but at crunch time, especially at the stripe and big games, I do think Josh Allen will be getting right along with his career averages there. So I have him going for about 600 rush yards. As you can see, if we move over here to the rushing totals. I'll try to kind of zoom in so you guys can see these things clear. I have him going for 112 carries, 661 yards, and six touchdowns, which is actually a little step back, accounting for the fact that they might take a little bit of rushing work off his plate. So that's where I see him fitting into the run game. And that does mean the scraps are not nearly as healthy for the Bills backs, despite being such an explosive offense. You know, when your quarterback's taking 25% or so of the rushing pie, that's that's nothing to sneeze at especially now with Damian Harris here too. This becomes a much muddier committee in my situation. I think he's an upgrade to Devin Singletary. So yes, James Cook get a lot of hype. I like the kid. But between Josh Allen and then Damian Harris stealing touchdowns, I think four touchdowns honestly might even be an exaggeration. He's going to have to be scoring out from far. And he can, he's a, he's a big play threat. He could be scoring out from far. But four touchdowns, maybe six total, if you add a couple receiving that seems about right for James Cook on 150 carries. A lot of talk about him being the lead guy, looking great in camp. But I still think Damian Harris, they didn't sign him just to just have him rot on the bench, and especially towards the stripe. So I see these guys in a, a near even committee with then Damian Harris coming out with a little bit more value for the rushing game. But Josh Allen, again, also such a big threat. So that's why neither of those guys, James Cook, Damian Harris, neither of those guys are inside my top like must draft right of the, the first eight rounds. Rounds 9 through 11, if, if Harris is lingering in round 11, 12, I, I've taken some stabs on him there. But I don't have much of James Cook at all. I do have a ton of Josh Allen, though. Uh, we'll talk about the passing game in a sec. But any of those metrics in the run game seem way off to you, Truth, or how, how are we rolling so far? No, I mean, you know, there's, I always have kind of like uh, my, my knee-jerk impression of any sort of scene. And, you know, I've, my knee-jerk impression of Buffalo is all like explosive offense. Man, I want pieces of that offense no matter what. And, you know, then you look at the running game, like you said, and it's like I, I, I can't help but feel extremely underwhelmed. Um, yeah. You're, you're looking at 
And I, I agree with your assessment of Allen. I, I think Allen might pull back a little on the running game, maybe or a tiny bit high, but not much at all. I mean, you know, minimum he's going to rush 100 times. You got him at 112. I mean, you don't have either running back. I'm looking at attempts. I mean, you don't have either running back – averaging 10 carries a game. I mean, like you got one guy at like seven or eight, one guy at nine. Yeah. I don't love that. So that's interesting. You know, my, my instinct um, without having done the research would have been like, Ooh, I like uh cook. I like Harris. I don't really though. Yeah. <laughs> it just ends up being the case when you have these Konami quarterbacks and then a split backfield behind them, most likely it, it becomes really tough to get value, but we did talk about this giant aerial pie and yeah, I love the aerial pie. Don't get me wrong. Oh, yeah. And I think we're going to get one of the best, if not the best we've ever seen. So Josh Allen before the injury, we keep going before versus after. He was on pace for 5,338 passing yards in weeks one through eight. They were airing it out like crazy. 37 attempts per game on pace for 641. And they were airing it deep very, very early and very, very often. So I don't know that he necessarily hits that. That would have been the third most yards of all time had he hit 5,338. But 314 yards per game, I mean, he could maybe hit that again this year and come close to that. So I do have him projected, if you scroll up here, right, to break that 5,000-yard barrier for the first time in his career, as well as crossing from the – he's always been around the 38 to 39 touchdown range these last couple of years. I think he breaks in and hits up to 40 this year. So we got a nice, healthy aerial pie, and I think it's going to be distributed as follows. 27% of that share going to Stefan Diggs. Uh, and th- this tool, again, I keep highlighting this uh, tool with Rotoviz, the projection machine, but it's what I love about it. So let's say I want to go to Y receiver one and see how the production has been shaking out. You can kind of zoom in and see Diggs ever since he arrived here, 28, 26, and 29 percent target share you know you can see his receiving yards 1400 1200 1600 so you, you can see all these different stats and how he's performed well being here with the bills 177 163 152 targets so i think we're, we're right in line 173 here 27 percent with what we've typically seen from stefan diggs i think he turns that into 119 catches he's averaged right around 65 to 72 somewhere in that range percent catch rate so he ca- catches around 120 balls for 1,618 yards and nine touchdowns. Now, keep in mind, too, before Josh Allen got hurt, we keep coming back to that, but uh, Stephon Diggs was on pace for 1,855 yards and 17 touchdowns. He was going absolutely bananas in those first seven weeks uh, prior to the injury for Josh Allen. So this this 1,609 is a lot, but it also might not even capture the true, true ceiling of Stephon Diggs. It's truly just what I expect from him. So I think that's just more the same quality first rounder. The other big guy, so behind him, it does get a lot shakier. You know, you know you're going to get 25 to 30% of the targets going there. So how is the rest distributed? So I had uh, Gabe Davis seen 17% share. That's what he got last year. Now, a lot of people are just probably tuning out now. I don't want any of Daddy Davis after what he did to us last year. And if that's your case, honestly, I couldn't really blame you. But I think he got that week one ankle injury and just wasn't really himself till towards the end of the year, right? In the playoffs hit, you know, 150 yards, two touchdowns. You saw the Gabe Davis. You thought you might see throughout 2022. So I, I don't not necessarily say we're going to get that all year, but I'm not going to say he's going to go a huge step backwards either. When they added nobody, they talked about their faith in him now that he's fully healthy. I think right along with those 100-ish targets you saw last year, you know, he's right around a 50% catch rate last year. So 976 and eight. The, the difference between Gabe Davis this year and last year is one, the health. But also, too, you don't have to pay a third, fourth rounder to find out. He's going yeah. around seven, eight, nine, even sometimes right now. Uh, you're buying him at his floor. He finishes the wide receiver 35, exactly. and you're drafting him as the wide receiver 40 right now when I think the ceiling is still there. Even if he matches what he did last year, you're getting him at that right cost. And I do think there's a ceiling now that he's healthy uh, for him to definitely shake things out. Are you, would you ever go to Daddy Davis? Or are you part of the crew that just hit tune out until I was done with with Gabe Davis? No, this was this was going to be kind of one of my hot takes coming in. Is like I'm I'm ready go, I'm ready to get back in the Daddy Davis business. Ah, nice <laughs> back in for Daddy. I love it. Um, yeah, I mean I, I agree with that. I hadn't actually I hadn't I hadn't heard your specific argument for it, but my thought was just like. His price, I mean, we loved this. Remember how much we loved him and Allen Robinson? Oh, my God. Oh, two of our worst predictions of all time. I know, I know. And we were, both, we, were, we, we were both really confident on both of those guys. And uh, with Davis, it's like I look at him and it's like, yeah, he was disappointing. Being a Davis owner last year was really frustrating. 
I genuinely still believe that the big dick talent is there. And I just, I don't think he's going to be worse. And I think there's a chance he's going to be way better. And you can get him kind of cheap, right? Yeah, like we're saying, rounds eight, nine sometimes right now. It's definitely the right spot. About seven on underdog in these early drafts that really he goes late. Spin, but even still, that's that's not bad. Like in that, that pick 75 to 80 range is where you're typically finding him. And I think, as you said, that's at his floor. That's that's what he did last year. Obviously, you want more. The fact that he was only a wide receiver one in two games of all last year. He was a top 24 receiver in just 33% of the games. Otherwise, it was a lot of duds, 5.5. He's not the type that even in his duds is at least getting you something serviceable. It was very boom or bust, but I do think this was the the least healthy we've seen Gabe Davis. We've seen him perform uh, much better clips. I I definitely think there's a – certainly at his price, I'm willing to buy it back. Behind him, unless Khalil, you know, there's Trent Sherfield's getting praise in early OTAs. Khalil Shakir has apparently stepped up. We've seen it before with like Isaiah McKenzie. There's always going to be this third guy in this explosive attack, and it typically just doesn't end up panning out because they cannibalize each other. But if you if you tell me Khalil Shakir or Trent Sherfield, one of the two separates completely, I might be intrigued. If you combine their numbers, you know, 489 and four, 386 and three, that, that would be a nice, useful wide receiver three if somebody in here truly took the every down role. But what we've seen in the past is it's about a, a shared role and 50% of the routes go to one guy, 60% go to the other. It becomes a mess. And that especially gets even more messy when they added Dalton Kincaid, the t- quote unquote tight end two on paper here. I think he's definitely the tight end one in terms of volume and performance, though. When all is said and done, I love this player. Maybe it takes a year. Sometimes we do see rookies translate slower, but I just, they're already raving about him in the slot as this big body that more of a receiver than a tight end. That's how he was addressed in college coming out. And that's how he's been translating so far in camp. So I see a big role for Dalton Kincaid, eight touchdowns. I don't think is completely unreasonable for a six, five guy in one of the most explosive offenses. He will be nibbling the cheese with dots and knots throughout the year. As you can see, a 14 combined touchdowns for him. Uh, but this is just kind of right in line. I bumped just last year. They targeted tight ends around 16 total percent with Knox seeing about 12%. I just bumped that to about 20% this year with 11% going to Kincaid, nine going to Dawson Knox. And yeah, a, a committee situation does make it a little trickier to top uh, trust each week. But if somebody was just going to take over and emerge as that, that no brainer, number one tight end here, it would be Kincaid. So I projected him a little bit higher. Uh, it's going to be a tricky situation though, if they both stay healthy, and they're constantly nibbling each other's cheese. What is up, you fantasy wolf? Thanks so much for tuning in. If you haven't already, share your thoughts in the comments, check out some more videos, and join the newest Wolfpack by subscribing below. Ooh.